we actually need something to dance to. So this is this is the this is the perfect example of um, he's right. In American production, it's all about keeping it unbelievably simple. You try to create lines that are repeatable, and you don't try to do too much. And K-pop, uh, and P-pop, and J-pop, and they're it's not about simplicity. It's about complexity. It Great day to play. It's a great day to play, everybody. Welcome on into the channel. Yeah. Well, this is your first time here. You are rejoining us. Thank you for being here with us today. You're loved, appreciated, always welcome here in this channel. And you are enough. Today, we're going to be getting into some uh, finally, finally, finally. I know you guys have been waiting for this. This is Simon Cerveda with the uh, behind the scenes of how he made what. And uh, I was waiting, honestly, for Lucas for this for a long time. And then Lucas was like, oh, I had already seen it. So I'm just going to do it alone today. Because Brad's running with a camel could have haunted him forever if he went in alone. But by choosing Morgan and Morgan, he would never have to be alone in the process. Look, I know that hiring a lawyer can be intimidating, but it doesn't have to be. By choosing the right law firm to be your partner, you can easily navigate through the toughest incidents. And with Morgan and Morgan, you have a true partner that you can trust. Did you know that you could sue when you're in an accident to be made whole? Did you know that you're not suing the person that hit you, but rather their insurance company? Did you know that you don't need a lot of money to hire a lawyer? You have questions and Morgan & Morgan has the answers. If you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. You can submit a claim in eight clicks or less without ever having to leave your couch. For more information, you can get started at forthepeople.com or dial pound law, that's pound 529, from your cell phone. Because uh, he's already seen it, so it wouldn't be as impactful as what it would have been if he hadn't seen it. And we do really try to do that where we're not like doing fake reactions for you guys, even though this is probably gonna be more of a chat and a breakdown. Uh, I unfortunately don't get Lucas all the time. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. I hope you guys enjoy this. Please let us know what your thoughts are below in the comments. Don't forget if you haven't already, like subscribe to the notification bell, follow along with our journey by checking out our live streams, Saturdays, noon central time. And you can check out our brand new single, My Light Out Now on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon. We actually should be doing, I don't know that he's done it yet. I don't think he has. We should actually be doing one very similar to this for My Light so you guys can see the breakdown and stuff if you're more interested in the technicalities and all the things that happen. Uh, behind the scenes on that. But without further ado, let's go. You have 500K views in three hours? That's me. That's, That's my crazy. name. Dude, I made this. That's so What's cool. up, welcome back to the channel. My name is Simon Servita. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I produced the single for the number one boy band in the country. No cap. Which country? <laughs> the Philippines. Which is really cool because my ethnicity is Filipino. I was born in Canada, but both my parents are Filipino. The group is called SB19. They're a P-pop group. That stands for Pinoy Pop. And the single I helped produce is called What? So I'm gonna give you guys a really detailed breakdown on the song. And I'm also gonna give you guys a behind the scenes on how we worked on it. Okay, let's take a look. Now this was easily one of the most challenging projects I've ever had to work on. For a lot of reasons, we'll get into that later. But let's start at the beginning. Like, how did I get the opportunity? There is a member on the group called Pablo. This is Pablo's face right here. He does a bit of production himself, so I guess he stumbled across a couple of my YouTube videos. And then he reached out to me. He was like, what's up? I said, what's up? He said, you trying to make something? I said, mm, maybe, perhaps. For the workflow, it was a lot of back and forth DMing. And then on occasion, I'd get on a Zoom call with him and his brother, Josh. Here's what Pablo sent me at the very beginning. We just started with the demo file. So all we have here is the top line and the guitar under it. Not to be completely honest, I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> I'm Filipino, I thought I knew Tagalog, but looking back, apparently I only know Tagalog that's used in a household setting. <laughs> so if somebody can translate this, I'd really appreciate it. There's actually a switch up in the song, so it goes from 112 BPM to 112, then 96. 
I never had to work on a song with the tempo change before. So this was this was tough for me. We're gonna just try to flesh this out because I So this is this is super, super interesting. You know, it, it, you never know when you're gonna get your break as a producer. You really don't. Um you never know when that one is gonna happen. And a lot of great, great producers go very long periods of time without getting anywhere. Obviously, the world has just become such a bigger place now. Bigger in some senses and smaller in some senses due to the fact that like it's bigger because I think that it's easier for people to outreach to others. It's smaller in the fact that like you could just reach out and like somebody from a different country could contact you and be like, hey, I want to do a song with you or I want to you, uh, you know, I want to use a beat that you have or something like that. And so there's a lot of cool stuff with that. But it's like it's even small things like, you know, we learn and we do new things every single day. And until you're exposed to it, you have no idea. So like small things like never doing a tempo change in a song, not even shocking, because especially if you're mostly doing uh, you, you know, if he's from America and he's mostly doing American style music, it's very, very rare that you're going to have things like tempo changes anymore, key changes, uh, things like that. So it's, it's kind of cool seeing that. And then like also getting songs from people. I don't, I don't think people realize like how much producers generally will actually do. Sometimes they're going to get something full, but a lot of times it's just going to be like this. It's like a melody line, some words, some vocals, and then maybe if you're lucky, some chords in the background that might go with the song. Uh, and then your job as a producer is to take all of that and make it into something. There are other times where you're actually going to be writing everything up front and then you're presenting it to other people in order to put melody and stuff in it later. So there's, there's a lot of different ways of doing it, but it's kind of, uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, just just hearing him be like, oh yeah, I had never done something like this before because you don't until you do. I listened to this once and I'm already really, really stuck. Like, how do we get back there? That's a- Yeah. What? And then the chorus, which is 96. Oh, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Interesting he uses a sequencer. Okay. So this is cool. This is some cool teaching moments. Um, so this is called a sequencer. Um, and I don't know if you guys can see my arrow right now. Maybe Ed can zoom in when this finally gets edited. Uh, and if you guys have questions while we're doing this too, like feel free to answer them because this is kind of one of those videos where it's kind of cool seeing how we're doing this in a live setting. If you guys have questions about it, that I can answer them. Um, but this is called a sequencer. This is a normal editing route. So, um, man, I wish like I had my own to pull up for you guys, but if I pull one up, it's going to screw everything up right now. Normally what will happen is if you're editing it here, you have, in this case, this is a 4-4 four, four song, so you have four beats per the measure. And then generally each one of these would represent a beat, or in this case, probably two or three, whatever they have for the bars right now. But instead of having it where he's going to be editing it like that in like an actual editing format, a sequencer does exactly that. It, you can put things in here and it does sequences. So each one of these is a beat. So here's beat one, beat two, beat three, beat four, second bar, beat one, beat two, beat three, before and then you can just put what you want to happen on those so instead of having to write them in manually or play the instrument manually he is instead writing them into this as a sequencer and then putting it up there and this is a pretty normal pattern uh it looks like we have um a kick here uh and probably what i'm guessing is like some kind of snare and then a second layer probably for um the kick as well so that's kind of what's happening here but this is like wait when you see this each each program is a little bit different do i know what's up this looks like it might be fruity loops maybe it look because this is an older version this looks like probably fl studio which i don't use uh, it's one of the few that I don't have experience. To be fair, when it comes to when it comes to production software, they're almost all the same. They just do slightly different things. But like, if you know how to write in one, outside of having to relearn some of the commands of like which one's the record button, which one brings on your click track, which one duplicates a track, like outside of learning the new commands and like where you click for those, they all do the exact same thing. If I open up any of the programs that we use, which um, I generally do a lot of my writing personally in Logic. I like writing in there just because the um, Logic's initial base of, of libraries that they have for instruments on top of the ones that we already have, for me, is easiest. I also will um, sometimes record vocals into Logic because I like the way that you can comp vocals in Logic. Um, so I'll do a lot of writing in there. Um, when it comes to tuning vocals, though, like Logic is a little bit inferior. Uh, we use Cubase a lot, which is what Lucas actually prefers to write in. And 
Cubase, what I like about the vocal editing in Cubase is when you move a vocal, so this kind of confusing. When you have a vocal line, right? Let's say that somebody is right here and they're on pitch. Well, that pitch actually might be up to 50 cents below or 50 cents below uh, above the pitch. So just because they're on E doesn't mean they're actually completely on E. They might be 24 cents below E and therefore to everything else that's perfectly on pitch, it sounds like it's still out of key. You can then take that vocal and you can manually move each piece, each little piece of the vocal up or down. Depending on the program is depending on the feedback that you're gonna get from that though. So in in logic when you move it up and down it gives you an artificial sound that tells you where the key is and the problem with that that i find with artificial sound when you do it is you don't get the voice character and that could change dramatically especially as most voices aren't completely flat so if you're just hearing an artificial sound when you're tuning there might be things that you're going to miss or you might mistune it because of that um in cubase though when you do the movement it gives you the true vocal character of the voice so for vocal tuning, I tend to like to use that. For really, really fine-tuned vocal tuning, we will use, or I will use Pro Tools. And Pro Tools is a little bit different because you can't just drag it up and down. You literally have to highlight. So like these things right here that you guys are seeing, these little pieces of a vocal, you would literally have to zoom in, highlight the portion, just a little piece that you want, and then you would manually uh, put how many cents you want it to go up and down in terms of pitch. So it's much more taxing to do it on Pro Tools, but you can really, really fine tune it on Pro Tools. Um, and then it's it's pretty easy to do on, on Cubase. So it, it really depends on what you do, but really you can do the same thing on every one and every single one of them will have different ways of doing this. You can edit it in line here, which I'm sure you're gonna see some of him, him doing later. So like for instance, so here we could open up like each of these individual ones and it would bring up like a different screen where we could go in and edit it that way. This is called MIDI this line right here so these are actually if you would open up this roll right here uh this would actually bring up like a it looks like a piano over on the side and like it'll show you what key like what actual notes those are on so um that's how you're writing these and then what he has back up here again this is a sequencer and sequencers can be used I, I know a lot of people will use sequencers for drums but sequencers can also be used for pitch so instead of having like um i've done this especially when writing some like house music techno music synth style stuff um sometimes like simple uh like small melodic lines in the background you would instead of these each being an instrument each one of these would be a pitch and then you can actually set it like let's say that i wanted to not do it in like a normal key i wanted to do it in like a um pentatonic key or something like that i could just set those notes and i could then go through i could make one of these hold out for two notes uh, I could make them all 64th notes if I wanted to and like have them like almost like trap hats and stuff like that. So uh, it's just a different way of writing in this in this thing right here. Okay, this is cool. I'm just gonna go through and we're gonna just talk about each one of these. So here he's adjusting the velocity of these to make them feel more realistic. So like, uh, when you're writing drums, when you're writing almost anything, nothing is the same melody. If like I was actually playing a physical drum, it wouldn't be boom 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 boom. It's gonna be boom 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 boom. Right? Like it's gonna be different velocities depending on how I'm hitting it. And that's what he's doing here is he's actually writing in the different velocities of the note to make some of them a little bit louder, some of them a little bit softer to make it more what it would actually sound like on a real drum kit. This is the more hip hop y part. I don't know if this is supposed to be the rockish part. So I sent him that first idea and it was pretty much wrong. <laughs> I had the hip hop and the rock part switched around. He said it should be similar to We Will Rock You. So I said, oh, okay. So once I realized it was switched the wrong way, then I made this one more rock inspired. Now we have the electric guitars. And then I'm also trying to like keep it a little bit modern. So I use more hip hop sounding drums. So this is actually, okay. I wish I could zoom in on this screen. I wish I could zoom in. Ed's gonna have to do a lot of this. Um, so this, if you can see this line right here where it says chorus guitar, chorus guitar 
um, there's the lead guitar that's happening down here, and then there's a chorus guitar happening down here. This is all fake. Like, none of these are real instruments that are playing. These are all just plugins that you use to emulate an instrument, and he's just writing in the way that that will sound on here, which is which is really, really cool, and I don't think that people realize it. Like, how much work has to go in for you to write a guitar chord in instead of just strumming it. Um, so you do have to have a little bit of uh, a little bit of knowledge there. So question, you mentioned FL Studio, Logic Studio, and Cubase softwares. Is that right? Yeah, so those are, so there's multiple different ones. The industry standard, the industry standard when um, for like professional mixing, mastering, editing. Industry standard is, is, um, um, lo uh, not Logic, I'm sorry, Pro Tools. Pro Tools is the industry standard. Most places, like if you wanted to, as a producer, get a job at a like large studio here in the US, you better have you better have uh, um, the uh, Avid Pro Tools uh, knowledge. And the reason that a lot of people, especially um, producers as they're starting out, the reason that most people do not use Pro Tools is because Pro Tools is no, has nothing like this program. So this this sequencer doesn't exist in Pro Tools, okay? Like you'd have to bring up a plugin for that. All of these things up here where it's like kind of doing things for you, uh, loop libraries, um, all that kind of stuff. Even the fact that like when he first brings this up, it's automatically gonna have like a master track. It's like all he has to do is drag this in here. None of that exists on Pro Tools. When you when you open up Pro Tools, Pro Tools is a blank slate. You have to set up everything from your audio tracks, whether you want your audio tracks to be mono or stereo, whether you want a software instrument track in there, even your stereo out tracks, your bus tracks. Everything you do has to be set up manually. It has to be set up manually. Other programs then are a lot easier for people to starting out, Logic um, is is very very easy because it does a lot of the things for you. If I wanted to go and I wanted to create a reverb send track, I literally would just go and click on the send button, and it'll create like a send track for me automatically, and then I just put like a reverb on it. Um, and a send track, by the way, uh, in this context, for those of you who don't know what a send track is, is you have different plugins that you will use on tracks and each one of those uh, does something different. So on a vocal track, you might have reverb on the vocal. I'm just gonna use that as a uh, example and maybe you'll use some delay on it. That's gonna sound like this. So right now, if you listen to my voice, there is a slight delay and there is a slight reverb on my voice right now because we have that set up for what we sing. That's something that you would take yourself and you would design that on a track. So you would click on the vocal track and you'd click on the plugins aspect. And then for effects, you'd go down, you'd find the reverb of your choice. You might design it differently. You might design the dry and the wet signal, which is how much of it goes through. Well, if you were to take, <clears throat> if you were to take the, uh, that same reverb and you have 20 different vocal lines because especially as you keep going you're going to have all of these different vocal layers and each one of those layers might have two or three layers with it if you were to put that reverb on every single one of them your computer has to process every single one every single one so instead a lot of times what you'll do is instead of putting it on each and every one and your computer is going to freeze up you will take that reverb and you'll put it on just a separate track which is called a send track and then you will send the vocal through that send track. You would send all the vocals or anything you want to go through there. And then for each individual vocal, you will adjust how much of that reverb you'd like to come through on there. So what it does is it ends up not only saving you resources on your computer because your computer would just shut down once you start getting into these big files, but it also then will make sure that the reverb that you're using on all of your vocals is the same. There are times there are times when it's going to make sense to use different types of reverb on instruments for effect, but most of the time you want to make sure that your reverb all sounds like you're in the same room because that's really where you're getting that effect from. If I was in a huge cathedral and I was singing, that natural acoustic that comes back at you, that reverb that's going to come back, is going to be different in that space than if I'm in, say, a bathroom because of how big that space is and how it's bouncing off and reflecting off of whatever it's reflecting off of. If I though put one on one vocal that sounds like it's in a cathedral and another one that sounds like it's in a bathroom and another one that sounds like it's in some open hall, those things are going to conflict with each other because they're going to be coming at different different ways. So generally it's a way also to make sure that you're getting all of your vocals and everything tied in uh, to one. So 
that's what, when I'm talking about send tracks, that's what I'm talking about with that. I'm trying to go through this one by one for you guys whenever I say something and realizing that you guys probably don't know what it is that I'm saying. So, um, and then each one of these is just a stem. So he's going to continue to build on these and build out. This is also why, if possible, I love working in person with artists because you never know if they're going to like an idea or not. And you can change them in real time as opposed to doing it all and then having to redo it. But uh, all right, let's go back a little bit to here. I can't remember. No, we were way, then I made there this. We go. Okay. That it should be similar to We Will Rock You. So I said, oh, okay. So once I realized it was switched the wrong way, then I made this one more rock inspired. Now we have the electric guitars. And then I'm also trying to like keep it a little bit modern. So I use more hip hop sounding drums. We ended up using a lot of this for the end of the song, but for the main chorus, this wasn't it. First chorus, pause, second okay. chorus, pause, okay. and then after the bridge. Okay, okay, okay. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about the tracks. This is this is kind of like an internal mix board. Um, when you guys see movies or when you guys hear of like what a studio looks like, you probably think of those ginormous mixing boards that have all of the levers that go up and down and that's an old analog board um and then you would assign things to each one of those tracks we do it a little bit differently here because we're in a new age so we have some analog equipment and then we do everything digitally on a digital board that's on a screen that we can pull up and this just basically does the same thing you can pull these up and down so each one of these is a track and when i was telling you like in um in pro tools that you have to set all this up each one of these tracks automatically is here when you add something in fruity loops uh or fl studios which is fruity loops um, Logic, Cubase, any of the other ones you really use besides Pro Tools, which is the industry standard, these uh, these automatically show up, and you have to do all that manually in uh, in in the other one. Each chorus, pause, and then another chorus with continuous beat, like the half happy one. It's funny because you probably heard me and a bunch of other producers say simplicity is key. Keep it simple. Mm. Don't want to do too much. But for them, it's the complete opposite. They want everything. They ask for a lot more complexity, which is like really refreshing. Pablo told me usually in K-pop and group songs, whenever there's a change in member, then there's also a change in sound. So for this group, there's like five members. So we're really changing it up every eight bars or so. There's a part yeah. later on in the song where they do a dance break. And they told me, you know, you can go crazy because we actually need something to dance to. So this is, this is the, this is the perfect example of um, he's right. In American production, it's all about keeping it unbelievably simple. You try to create lines that are repeatable and you don't try to do too much. And K-pop uh, and P-pop and J-pop, and they're, it's not about simplicity. It's about complexity. It's not just about the vocal shining through. It's about the whole song as a whole and it telling a story. And that's ultimately why Lucas and I love doing that. And we don't get to do a lot of it here because we don't have groups like that here. That's not what people are making here. They're making simple stuff, which again, it's fun to do, but this is, like he said, it's fun to do something like this. It's extremely hard. And that's why most people don't because this song, he could have probably popped out 10, 15, 20 simple tracks for other artists that were, that were just simple artists as opposed to this one track. It probably took him the same amount of time to do one track that he could have popped out 15 or 20 for somebody else because they are very, very, very complex. I'm giving you the perks, I'm giving you the fills, I'm giving you the slides just so that they can do a little of this, do a little, <laughs> little of this. Let's take a look at some of these demos. I also had a lot of trouble figuring out the verses. Just because the tempo 112 is in this weird spot where it can sound good either half-timed or double-timed, it can be slow like this. Or we can make that twice as fast with something like this. Let me show you some of these attempts. Oh, this attempt was weird. Listen to this one. Completely different feel. 
there was around 10 arrangements and I think at around arrangement five is when we had a good idea of what the song's gonna be. And then after that, it was just fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning. For the verse, we ended up going with this really spaced out brass melody. You layer that with this high that. lead thing. For this one, the drums are really simple because we wanted to drop it halfway in. Same pattern as this one, the first one, but this one is um like cut cut, but this one is continuous. So. Gotcha. And then during the second half of the verse, we have the brass melody that does a lot more. Like Capital Siren. The drums are doing a lot more as well. For the second verse, it's really similar to the first verse, except we got rid of the brass and instead we just replace it with every single percussion known to man. <laughs> this thing, weird filtered percussion loops, more percussion loops. Glass thingies, snare stuff, whatever this is. Hi-hats, more hi-hats, some really glitchy toms, more percussion, more fills. And then during the second half, it's like the first verse. Here's an example of the workflow. So I just send him a Dropbox link with the song, and then he just sends me back a list of notes. Make it sound grimy, maybe try a new melody, maybe put in a new instrument. The car should be a bit fussy. I think that should be a first. We decided for the chorus that it should be really big and something really uh something really cool about this is like working with somebody that knows what they're talking about. You know, it's it's very, very clear as you hear the conversation that they're having back and forth that Pablo knows the direction to give him. Most of the time as producers, we don't we don't have that luxury, you know, and it can be a gift or a curse. You could you could work with an artist who knows but doesn't know how to implement it. And so he's got a very specific vision, but like is going the wrong way with it. So they could be really like stubborn. But then you also have the, the good thing of them being able to help you you know, if they really know what they're doing, like Pablo does, where they can really kind of give you ideas of like, this is what I'm thinking, and they can verbalize exactly what they're thinking, as opposed to having an artist with no songwriting ability, which is most artists, honestly, most good artists um, don't do a lot of songwriting. They don't do, and even if they do lyrics or they do melodies, they don't understand the production elements that go behind it. So they don't know how to verbalize and tell you what they want. They're just like, this isn't it. And so you like the a producer's job is to go through that process with them and try to get their ideas from here to here. And and that's where a lot of the work comes from. So it's very, very interesting to seeing their workflow um, here because it's, it's a lot of him being able to say like, hey, going through line by line and being like this, you know, this 20 seconds, we need it to be here. This, try this, try to put more of a bass in here, try a different bass in here. You know what I mean? Like those are all really, really cool moments here that you don't get with a lot of normal artists that you're working with. They're just going to be like, I don't like it. What don't you like about it? I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. I don't like it, you know? And so those are all things that, uh, that happen. But this is all that you can start seeing how big, and you, you can't even see to the top or the bottom of this, but you can start seeing how big these tracks actually get because a lot of times you're writing all these little itty bitty pieces, right? This little vocal chirp here, uh, this little melodic line here, like all these things they have to like be built from from the ground up and you don't realize how many of them you end up having until you start getting into it. And kind of cinematic. So I added these massive, massive toms to just kind of drive the rhythm. Cool. Sounds very abilitant. And then everything is kind of just following that. Yeah. For the intro, they wanted the main melody of the hook, but that turned into this big marching band brass idea. I think this was the first attempt. But 
that he said it sounded a bit. I'm also really, I'm sure that this is something that they had worked out in advance that he probably said like, hey, I'm willing to do this for you. And they probably worked out some deal, but I want to be able to do this because there is a lot of groups that don't want to show you how the, sh the, the sausage is made. Um, there's a lot of people out there that don't want you to see the process, right? They're very secretive. So it is very cool here uh, that they were very, very open about him showing all of this stuff on his channel. Like, I really, uh, I really like that. It's too happy, it should be a lot darker. So what I did instead was I kind of rewrote okay. the melody. So uh, this is a perfect example of what we were just talking about here. So I think there should be four more bars or even more before the chorus melody comes in, like a marching band closing in. It shouldn't sound like ha happy band. It should sound more like death marching band. And maybe instead of trumpets, use brass hits. So there's grit. Like these are things you're never like these types of edits you're never going to get from somebody that doesn't understand production and songwriting uh, a little bit like they, this is something of clear um understanding of of production when you get an edit like that or a note like that it should be a lot darker so what i did instead was i kind of rewrote the melody so that it sounded a bit darker the original melody is like this and then what i did was And then we just put that on a bunch of horns. Mm. That's a really cool horn, uh, horn sample. Then there's a high horn that comes in. And then just some marching band style drums to go with it. Man, one of the reasons this was such a difficult project was because I was being stupid. As you saw before, we went through a bunch of arrangements and different demos. And since I'm so lazy, instead of deleting all these instruments, uh, I just kept adding them onto the project. And then moves. it was just this big file where there's too many plugins and there's too many sounds and every single track in my mixer chain is used up. It was just a lot of me wasting time waiting for stuff to load. And then yep. it ended up crashing and I'd lose entire hours just trying to render. Okay. So th it's the the biggest thing, the biggest mistake that we make as producers, and it doesn't matter how well versed you are, you get really, really excited about something and you get lost. Like we get lost in the music and the creation process. And man, Control S or Windows S is your friend. You have to save all the time because it is not abnormal for, because again, these programs take up so much memory there's so much computer usage usage happening and if you don't save often you will lose hours of stuff and trying to recreate that process of where you were at sucks and like he did here like the other thing is like if you don't keep your stuff clean as you go you will start running into these issues where you run out of space where you now have to go through later when you start getting done and you're like oh crap where was where was this vocal chop where was this ad lib where was this and like you're you're going through now a hundred tracks to listen to everyone individually because uh because of that so um but yeah you got you really got to all the time you can be you you should be saving what you're doing uh, and the other thing that I've seen a lot of people make mistakes at is they don't save different versions of their project. So if I start working on a project today and I come back tomorrow to work on that same project, I'm going to save it as an, a completely new project file, the whole thing. So one will be, you know, day one or like whatever the date is, and then I'll have the next date on the next one and the next date on the next one, because what will happen otherwise is you will sometimes want to go back like what he was putting there. He's got all these different ideas and he's got all these different arrangements in there. But now you're playing a game of figuring out which one was which, where instead what I'll do is I'll just say, like, okay, oh, I really liked. I, I remember that on, on day one, I had this I had this really, really cool melody and I deleted it in the future. I'll just go back to day one, copy it out of day one, and then carry it back over to my new project. And so that way, like every single day that I come on and if I lose data or if something happens, I have different backup copies if a file were to get corrupted as well. So like I always, you know, when we're when we're going through that process, creating different project files each time so you can always go back to an earlier version if you need to is... Uh, is also extremely important because you can lose a lot otherwise. Here's stuff out. It was a lot of this. A little yep. blue circle and just praying this thing yep. doesn't crash. He's had a lot of plugins. I don't think this one's going to open. Guys, don't be like me. Be organized. Let's take a look at some of the dance break attempts. Okay, let's 
Let's take a look at this one. The drum groove was pretty much there. It was mainly just finding what's gonna be on the top melody. What is this one? Oh, this one. I like this one. That's cool. I like that sound. Oh, this one is hard. Then they wanted the dance break to be twice as long and they told me during the second half, just kind of go crazy on the drum arrangement. I ended up doing this thing where like the first half is trap and then the second half is more of like a reggaeton deal. Cool. And then there's a bunch of weird like fails on this one. Like... <laughs> yeah, like this melody was cool, but it didn't sound like anything from the rest of the song. So we decided that it should kind of sound similar to the intro I made. New horn melody. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no copyright song. Yeah. No copyright song over here. <laughs> After that, we have like these. He's, he's putting that in there so he could monetize it like he was putting it in there that he wasn't taking it from their song. That's why he's keeping these really, really short. So he was singing over it so it didn't uh <laughs> it didn't catch it that's so funny high horns that come in high horns high horns in the no copyright song okay okay no copyright song through the dance mm -mm 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 -mm. oh a lot of same old back that's and so forth funny. back and forth drop box like drop box blink little changes little changes until we got to like the final product let's check the info really quickly 91 hours and 45 minutes. Are you insane? That's yeah. like 24, 48, 72, 9. That's Over almost four, four entire days. They yeah. got it sent for mixing and then they gave it back to me to do a bit of the final mix and then it got sent off to mastering and that was everything from my end. And here we are, the premiere day. I haven't seen this yet. 500k views in three hours. That's me. That's my name. So for for those of you, uh, for those of you who don't know, music production goes through multiple stages in um the first stage in the creative process is generally the production so a producer generally will do exactly what he was doing you're putting all the elements in that's part of the composition project so most of the time producers also do compositions and you're creating melodic lines beats uh, drum lines percussion lines chord progressions whatever all the musical elements that are going to be in the song is part of the production phase once that's done, oftentimes the either the artists themselves in coordination with the producer or the producer will make kind of like a reference mix of what the artist's initial idea was for that song. So that's where um, volume comes in, automations come in, uh, the type of um, plugins that you're using, reverb, delay, things like that those things come into play on the vocals and then that mix will generally get sent off to who is considered to be a mixer a lot of producers will know how to do all three but generally you don't it because each one is time consuming and a lot of times you don't want it's hard to mix and master your own track because you've heard it so many times that oftentimes you will miss elements in the track you will miss that maybe there's too much high end too much low end you know, uh, that there's a part that's off, that there's a, a, a random, you know, sound sample or something in there, that there's a scratchy noise in the background. You, you, your ears literally get blind to it because, like he said, 91 hours is what he spent on that. So that then gets sent off. All of those stems will get broken down and they will get sent off to somebody else. And then they will redo and remix it all. So now that they have the elements, they'll actually go through and they'll adjust the volumes on everything. Um, they will go through and put in different effects on everything um, based on what the artist wants or based on the reference track. And a lot of times when you get reference tracks for mixing as well, um, which we've had before, is sometimes people don't come to us for production. They come to us just for mixing. And so they will send us their song and they'll say, here's, a, here's our song. 
Here's the base, the base version of all of them completely raw, dry, okay? So there's nothing on them. There's no effects on them. There's no automation on them. There's no volume change to them. Then they'll send me their reference mix of kind of their idea that they had in their head of the direction that they want to go with the song. And then oftentimes they will also send a reference mix of a similar song that they're trying to make it sound like, that they want the mix to sound like. And this could be a huge song, right? This could be... In their term, they were, they were talking about production. He's like, think of We Will Rock You. But somebody could literally send you, like, I want it to sound like this. I want the backing parts. I want the, the the effects. I want them to sound like this. I want it to sound like a Travis Scott song. I want it to sound like a... Uh, a I, was, <laughs> I didn't want to use his name because he's, he's canceled now. But I want it to sound like a Jay-Z song, though. I want it to sound like a Jonas Brothers song, right? Every artist kind of has their own flavor and flair that they use. And so oftentimes the artist will send their mix of kind of the idea that they originally had when they produced it or worked with their producer. And then they will send a reference mix of what they are trying to accomplish. And then the mixer's job is to go through and try to do that to the best of their ability and go back and forth with now the artist and make it sound all of those elements out there there make it sound the way that they want it to sound it's an extremely important part of the process most people don't realize that like it's it really does make a difference to whether something sounds like it should be on the radio or not that's this that's only the second part of the process the third part of the process is what's called mastering and this has changed over the years but basically it takes that song and it does slight tweaks and adjustments to make it really really fit for radio it used to be that the master artist song because things were done in records would be that their job wasn't just to make sure that all of it was made for radio but that each song from the first song to the 12th song on the cd was sounded the same so like as they transition from one song to the next, that one wasn't louder than the other one, that they all kind of had the same sound quality to them. And then to make sure that when they actually created the CD, that it was that it was all there. So there's there's multiple different elements. And oftentimes when you see it, you'll see production, you'll see mixing engineer, you'll see mastering engineer. Sometimes you'll even have a different recording engineer of the person that actually was in the person in the studio that recorded with the artist. So there's all kinds of different elements that go into that how do producers get paid is it by project by the number of hours spent on the material um Roman, that's a good question um it there is a ton of different ways that producers can get paid it, it really really depends um sometimes there to me there's a difference between producers and beat makers and, and there's a whole argument to be had about this Producers, to me, are doing what he's doing, where you kind of really, really work back and forth with the artist to create something of what they want. You're working on it with them the entire time. Um, a beat maker, a lot of times, though, is somebody that like just makes those backing tracks of what he was working on and then puts it out there for sale, and then people can just buy that beat from them, okay? Um, they don't really do a lot of the engineering aspect with the artist. Now... Those individuals generally get paid based on the track itself. Oftentimes, all they're going to do is they're going to sell it, okay? And the payday comes in the form of, right now, in terms of, like, beat stars and stuff like that, um, there are... You could go and lease beats, which literally, I know it sounds weird, but like you could have a beat and 20, 30, 100 people could be using that same beat and then they lease it from you. So it's a non-exclusive right. And maybe they charge $40, $50, $100 a piece for up to 10,000 streams. And after 10,000 streams, they have to renew the lease on it. And then somebody could buy the exclusive rights maybe to that song for $20,000 for that backing track. And a lot of times, this is where a lot of big artists and rap stars and stuff like that, they're going on, they're going on to um, beat stars or places like this, and they're just buying a backing track from somebody so they don't have to pay them percentages. They buy the exclusive rights to it, and they pay them an upfront fee, and then the producer then foregoes any additional money that they would have. Uh, another way that the producers get paid, which for... Um, uh, a lot of people, this is kind of the way that it will work, is they will split percentages of the song. So, um, for instance, depending on how much song writing each member has in that process, you get paid songwriting credits on the front end and you get paid master credits 
on the back end. And oftentimes that's the, the producers will get like a percentage of that. Then that percentage is something that's negotiated based on the record label, the artist, how much work goes in. So it really, really depends on that. Uh, but it is a negotiated process. It could be 50, each, each side uh, splits 50%. It could be if there's multiple members of the group. So like SB19 might just have a contract, but let's say that you're working with five people and they're from five different places. Um, then the royalty splits literally when, when you start a deal, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, um, an aspiring artist or music producer or whatever, and you're watching our channel right now, you're like friends don't exist in music, like in this regard. Okay. Never, ever, ever say, Hey, we're friends right now. Let's just trust each other and go at it. It never works out. I promise you, I promise you. Every single time that we sit down with an artist, if we have a new artist that comes in a studio and they want to work with us and we're going to be writing a song for them, if they're not just paying us for services to like record something for them and give them it back, if they're coming in and we're going to be writing, the first thing that we do is we sit down and we fill out what is called a split sheet. And in that split sheet, it's going to list every single person's name that's going to be involved in that process. If they have a BMI number to register it, what that BMI number is. And if they don't have either BMI or ASCAP number, they need to get one or need to be registered for one because they're going to have to get paid what everybody's split is and what their contribution was to it. And every single person that's involved in that will sign that sheet so that everybody knows exactly who's getting paid what because it is something you never ever want to do afterwards and you never want to know who owns the rights to your song or or what it is okay and that includes your front end songwriting credits and also the master credits who actually owns the copy of the song you know uh if you're a starting artist and you don't realize that that's how it works you go into a production shop and they agree they're like oh well we're going to produce this for you for you for free and you're like oh yeah i'm going to have my song out there and like okay we're going to give you 50 50 split on the songwriting credits and but they own 100% of the master and you didn't get any of the master, they could decide never to release that song and hose you because they own it. They own the right, like you would get songwriting credits if it was being played, but they own the actual physical copy of the master of the song. They can hold on to that. Um, and so all of those things are things that get pre-negotiated. So yes, like royalties and things like that. Um, that's a lot of times how it will be. So sometimes it's upfront payments, sometimes it's royalty payments, and sometimes it's a mixture of both. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's 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 just very it's very very interesting. And there's a lot of things. Again, most artists, and this is why people hire management companies. This is why people have record labels because there's so much information to know about the ins and outs of the music business and what's required of you when you release something whether or not something has to be cleared because you used a sample from somebody that isn't a free sample or a free license sample like there's so much that goes on behind it um that it's very very easy as an artist though to get screwed over because you don't understand it um, and if you don't have money as an artist and you're just relying on people and you get like, I don't know how many artists or people that I know that like got record deals and they were like, oh, I'm, I'm signing with so-and-so and they get screwed because they sign a five-year, 10-year contract with that record label because they're just so excited to do it, not realizing that they don't own any of the rights to their music and that they're an exclusive contract that they can't get out of. And now all of a sudden as an artist, they're <laughs> fighting uh, and waiting they can't re-release as a new artist um this is actually one of my instructors from when i was at la film uh school um they were in a situation where they had a band that started making it really big here they signed with a record label the the story goes the record labels owner the, i don't remember if he was cheating on his wife there, there was something happening where he was like doing something untoward and he ended up having an issue and literally the record label ended up going like belly up. But the way that the contract was written is that they ended up having to uphold to that contract that they had. So they were not allowed to release their music and they were not allowed to re-debut as a group in the US. So they ended up moving, I think he moved to Brazil. They ended up having to move out of the country as a group and as an artist to perform there and try to get into the music scene there because they were not allowed to for three or four or five years, whatever it was, they weren't allowed to do work here as artists. And then once his contract was up, he ended up, um, he ended up coming back. So um, it's, it's like, you know, 
always read the fine print. If you can't afford an attorney, like, you know, there, there are always ways, there's always people to reach out to. There are always ways that like sometimes attorneys will like do things after the fact of like doing percentages and splits and stuff like that. Um, but like it, it you always want to double check. Have your like if you can't afford somebody, find the smartest person that will give you free advice that knows something about reading contracts and 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 network. And that is it's it's so important because too many artists get taken advantage of. So many artists give up so much of their rights to record labels and they're paying them off for years and never make a single dollar. I saw somebody say cough K-pop and yeah, it's you know, they don't realize and to be fair, the record labels are are front in the bill, right? But if a record la company goes and you let, let's say you got seven members in your group and a record label goes and puts out um they they sign you up to a deal. They say, "Hey, we're going to front you we're going to front you $100,000 to uh to create your album. We're going to front you with 100 grand. It, within that you need to use this producer and you're going to have this much and then whatever you have left over is it. That's a, a lot of times the way that it works in America, but with a lot of these groups that are in these huge ones that have management companies on top of record labels. So, for instance, we just watched uh we just watched Vision Vision has a record label now called Republic Records. That record label is fronting a lot of the cost likely for their music videos for them to produce music. In addition, they also have a agency, whether it be a talent agency or a management company that's managing them, that is also probably fronting some of the costs of the members. So at the end of the day, the record label, when they, let's, let's say that they release a song and I'm, I'm using just I'm not saying that this is the way with Cornerstone. I'm just using them as an example because people can see that there's that there, okay? I just want to be very clear about that. Let's say that the record label comes in and the record label is fronting and owns 70% of the masters or 100% of the masters, and they own 50 or 60% of the songwriting up until a certain point, and then it goes to 40%. And then the management company is taking an additional 20% off the top of everything that's happening. Well, all of that upfront cost to either brought to them by the record company and or the management company has to be paid back by those artists before they even generally get a dollar. So a lot of times in K-pop, and I'm sure it's the same in P-pop, I haven't talk to them enough but in k-pop they get basically stipends they get like okay you're gonna get five hundred dollars a week to pay for your living expenses uh or maybe their living expenses are covered because they all live in a joint house or apartment and their travel expenses are covered so they get five hundred dollars a month to just pay for room and board and whatever they want to do with and then everything else though every single other dollar that they make goes to the record company and the management company before the artists get anything. And whatever those upfront costs are, which could get into the millions of dollars, guys. You know, think of, I, I think of um, First One. First One had that video that they claimed cost 300,000, um, I think it was like 300 or 400,000 US dollars to produce. It was like 10 or 20 million uh, uh, Filipino peso to 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 make that four hundred thousand dollars went against the artist. It's not like oh it's there and we don't have to pay it back. The artists have to pay that back. Now if you have five six seven members, you're splitting up those costs, but you're also getting less back. So now let's say that everything is let's say three years down the road, you're finally at the point where you paid your label off, and everything's good, and you're finally getting a percentage the percentage that those seven artists are probably splitting by the time that you that the the record company and the management company and whoever else gets their split might be 12%, 18% at the most and you're splitting that between 5 6 7 8 people so it's i, I don't think that people realize when it comes to these huge production elements especially once you get into the k-pop and the p-pop and the groups there's a reason why american uh, companies don't really go for like boy groups and girl groups anymore because there's not as much money in the record sale aspect. They have to focus on live performances, on merchandise, on other ways to bring in income rather than just that. And I know that we <laughs> we we went on a huge, huge tangent here about this, but this is part of what's cool about watching stuff like this is we really get to talk about this side of things and there was a lot of good questions. So I hope that that answered, uh, I hope that... Uh, that answers a lot of your your questions, but all right, we're gonna we're gonna continue with the video. I I I could be here all day, literally talking to you guys about this.
Let's go. I made this. Coolest no feelings. Man, I don't even, it's kind of hard to believe right now. Yes, sir. It's been three hours. Look at all these reactions. Mm -hmm. I gotta watch all of these. This is gonna take up my whole day. <laughs> Their fan base is insane. Oh my, oh my Guys, are you, how come you guys don't do this for my videos? <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be the end of this video. I don't know what to say. It hasn't really sunk in yet. This is like the biggest project I've ever been a part of. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't feel real. I have to give a big thank you to Pablo for giving me the opportunity. Shout out to everybody who worked on it. If you want to see the full video, that's going to be in the description. Just do a little favor for me and blow it up. If you're wondering if we're going to work again, the only thing I can say is maybe, I don't know, perhaps. I'm going to watch more reactions now. If you have any suggestions, leave a comment. If you like this video, leave a like. If you really like this video, subscribe. If you didn't like this video, leave. Just leave. <laughs> Get out of here. Wait, 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 that's wait. Really I funny. always wanted to do this. Do a little of this. Yeah. Just a little smirk That's emoji. So cool. Just a little, hmm. Keep it real subtle. Like, I'm so damn cool. That's hmm. so cool. Whatever. Just made this song. Produced it. Hmm. Whatevs. Um, okay, very, very cool. I did want to point out something else that I caught in here uh, that's interesting. This is also interesting when... Um, Producers come in all shapes and sizes, and we do the best with what we have in terms of the environments we have. Um, one of the things that obviously we want to do as producers is we want to put ourselves in the best space to be able to hear the the different frequencies and the things in sound design. Um, there are multiple different ways uh, to set up a room, but generally when you set up a room acoustically, like the one we have, you want it to be longer than it is wide because or else it's the way that sound travels and the way that it bounces back at you. Um, and then you also, if you can, don't want it to be like a perfect square rack. Like if you can have like cut off edges or like edges that go in, um, like a lot of the rooms won't be symmetrical. It won't be like a rectangle. It'll be like a parallelogram almost where it's like kind of offset because of the way that sound travels. And I just say that because his room is actually set up, his mixing room of where this is, is actually set up the opposite um, because it's just the space that he had and he did the best with what he could, but it's always cool to see and people don't realize like you can do so much now without having to have a professional space. I always think of um, Billie Eilish's uh, whole first album that her brother did was literally done on a cheap two up Focusrite uh, uh, audio interface and a laptop in her room. Like that's where that's where it was recorded, mixed and mastered. And so I, I just I just thought it was kind of cool here, just to uh, just to see that that like. You know, this is somebody who clearly has a passion for doing this and didn't have the professional space to do it, but you don't have to. You really can do a lot with this. Now, this would not be a good room, though, if you're bringing in people to do vocals and like trying to do, you know, engineering there for bands and groups and stuff. This would be a terrible room to do this. But for mixing and mastering, he's set it up, put some of the wall panels up and things like that to at least try to make it as acoustically pleasing as possible. And then you just wear headphones a lot. Uh, to try to make sure that you're getting all the sound stuff in that you need to get in. So anyway, before we end this, because this is a super, super long video, this is, this is really, really cool. Uh, I'm going to open it up and leave it up to any questions. This is going to be a very, very long video by the time this comes out, but I'm sure that people are going to be entertained if they like sound design or anything like that at all. Um, yeah, he's. I, I would love to sit down and talk with him. I know a lot of people have recommended that I try to just reach out and we could maybe just nerd out and talk about some of this stuff, but I feel like it would be, it'd be really cool just to talk with him. I like his, I like his ideas about uh, sound design and how he approaches it. So it's very, um, very, very cool. Plus he seems like he's a cool guy, which is very important to me. I, you know, I like cool people. This very, very long hour long video. Of, I'm almost glad that Lucas wasn't here. Could, could you imagine how long this video would have been if Lucas was here? We just had like a whole four hour stream just about this video. I've said this before, Josh. Thank you for always being patient and explaining and educating us when you do reactions. This is what sets you apart from other reactors. Thank you, Salama. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's it's cool. I, I like sharing my passions and my love for some of this with all of you. And I just notice more and more. I try to really stop because there's so many things that we discuss or we talk about or that he even discussed and talked about here where there's elements like it's cool seeing what he's doing. But if you don't know or understand it, you don't know or understand it. So, um, I, I love I love being able to do that and kind of nerding out with you guys and you know explaining all those things. So thank you guys. Uh, I do really really appreciate you all uh, being here for this one. I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Please 
Uh, if you're still here watching this after an hour, thank you. Uh, leave your comments down below. I do love reading them. Uh, if there's more stuff that you'd like us to do like this, please let us know that as well. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell if you already haven't. Follow along with our journey. Check out our live stream Saturdays, noon Central Time. This was actually a pop-up live during the week. So if you make sure that your notifications, everything are turned on, you'll be able to make sure that you don't miss any of that. And if you're waiting for your secret code, let's keep it music related for this one. We're going to go with keyboard music note. I th I'm 99% positive there's a keyboard there. So keyboard music note, like a little piano emoji kind of. That'll be fine. If nobody told you that they love you today, please do not forget that I love you. You're appreciated. Always welcome here on this channel, and you are enough. And last but certainly not least, it was great to play. Thanks, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.